as we move through Joshua, we're almost at a close. We've been covering the last few chapters here at uh, an amazing speed. Usually I do like three, four verses a Sunday, and we've been doing like six or seven chapters. It's amazing. Uh, we've been talking about undaunted faith because Joshua presents us with this idea that we have challenges in this world, and we are going to need faith to deal with them. They had been given this brand new land that they had to take and they had to continue to occupy and to, and to make it work for them. And as we work through the book of Joshua, we come to the place where we are, are instructed about how to live with the challenge that, that God has given to us. We need to talk about altering reality, making sure that God is at the center of all the reality that we see. This is Baymax, by the way, for those of you who don't know. I love this little guy. Uh, he's the friendliest robot I have ever seen. Uh, he is a, a medical robot, and he was made nice and fluffy so that people would be very comforted by his, his uh, appearance. If you haven't seen this movie, at the end, Baymax and his best friend are about to die. They have saved the planet, but they are in a world of hurt. They are in a place that they can't get out of. They are, there's no hope for them. They're totally coming to the end of their rope. But Baymax turns to his friend and says, if you tell me that you no longer need my services, I can save you. Well, what about you, his friend asks. Are you going to save yourself? No, I can't save myself. I can only save you. And he says, I'm not going to do that. He says, you have to do that. You have to say, your services are no longer, I am satisfied with your service, I think is the phrase. And finally, he turns to Baymax and says, I am satisfied with your service. And Baymax launches him towards safety and saves him. And end scene. Now, if you want the spoiler alert, Baymax does live. Um, sorry, I just ruined the movie for all of you who haven't seen it. This is what God wants us to do, to give our lives for others. He gave his life for us. Spoiler alert, he lived. Um, and he wants us to do the same thing for all of his people. We need to live together. We need to work together. And our attitude should be that we give our lives for others. This section details how the Israelites were supposed to live in the land. The first three quarters of the book deals with how they are supposed to, to take on this challenge of conquering this land, of moving into this land, of, of accepting God's promises. But now they're supposed to learn to live in this place. Chapter 22 talks about this subtle centrifugal force. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to listen to the sermon either. Uh, I'm sure that's what, was that a she or a he? Was that, never mind. <laughs> there is this, there's this subtle force here in chapter 22 that wants to divide the Israelites. Uh, it has to do with geography. It's not a big deal, it's, but it turns into this huge thing that threatens them. The eastern tribes were afraid that they wouldn't be included by the west. They were afraid that they wouldn't be accepted or their children wouldn't be accepted in the future. And so they, they devised this means of, of accomplishing this unity. The, the, East, the Western tribes are thinking that the Eastern tribes are committing apostasy. They still feel guilt over apostasy that they've committed, over adult, idolatry that they've committed, adultery that they've committed. And now they're thinking those people are going to do that too because they're just like ours. And so they have this fear that they're going to commit the same sins that everybody else has committed. The story moves from Shiloh, and then it moves back to the east side of the river, and then it back, goes back to Shiloh. Uh, this is the Jordan River. It's not much of a river, but it's, it's, it's wide enough to create a problem to their unity. We have a new important theme that we see here in chapter 22, and that is that geographical distance can never separate you from the love of God. That nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
no matter where you go, no matter how different you are, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And this is something that they needed to learn. The chapter also brings to a conclusion the inclusion of outsiders. The inclusion of outsiders, the acceptance of people that are not like their own, is an important theme in the book of Joshua. We see it very, very quickly with uh, Rahab the harlot. She was a, a prostitute, she was a Canaanite, and she is included. We see it with a whole group of people with the Jebusites. They are included in, in Israel, and they get a part uh, to play. And now these Easterners, these Western Easterners, I keep, uh, all right, I'm going to just apologize for now. I'm going to get the east and the west sides confused, okay? I'm going to say east when I mean west and west when I mean east. You just, you just deal with it, okay? Just accept it. Uh, <laughs> they're upset at the Easterners. They're thinking, oh, those people are just a little bit different than us. They don't live where we live. They live on the other side of the river. And that's not good. They're not one of us. Little differences. The problem proves to be a, a witness to the loyalty to God. It eventually turns out to be a great thing that they had this problem. A great thing that they erected this altar because everyone knew that they were now part of Israel. And we in future generations, need to know that we are all serving the Lord, if we are indeed serving the Lord. We start off with troops being dismissed. That's Ike dismissing the troops, by the way. Um, World War II, you remember Ike? Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. Young people back there. Uh, young people? I think Gene might remember this war, but I sure don't. The East Jordan tribes had fulfilled their promise to Moses and to Joshua. Way back in the book of Numbers, God had made them promise, Moses had made them promise to go fight with their brothers until all the land had been conquered. And now they had fulfilled that promise and it was time for them to go home. They didn't abandon their brothers in any of their hardships. They stuck with them. Verse 3 tells us they had reasons to bail. It wasn't that, you know, a difficult, it was a difficult thing to stay with them. And they had all kinds of problems. There were these long marches that they had to put up with. There was the possibility of, of injury and death. In all the wars that they fought, they, they was, were battling for a land that was not their own. And yet they stuck with it the entire time. They were away from their wives and children. You know, this is a, this is a poster from World War II, and the guys over there had to be worried about their wives and kids back home. Well, the, Re the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were worried as well. Through it all, they remained loyal. Not just to, to their brothers, but to God. They remained loyal to their promise. Ultimately, we have to remain loyal to God. We have to remain loyal to each other. This is what God is asking us to do. God has given the West Bank rest, and now the East Bank tribes get to go home. What a great day. They can now return to their property that God had given to them. And it mentions time and again that God had given them this property. They were, uh, the book of Joshua is, is telling us over and over again that they are not different. They are part of Israel. This was their land. This was, this was supposed to be theirs, and they had been given it by God himself. And don't exclude people that God includes. Their land fulfills promises to Abraham and is part of the promised land. That question is asked a lot when it comes to whether these tribes on the, on the east bank of the river were obedient to God and, and were not really, you know, into uh, the, the land of promise. But this part of Joshua makes it very clear that they were united, that this part of, of, of the world belonged to the Israelites, and they were all Israelites in this together. Contrary view of them and their land soon crops up. It's those people over there. Verse 5 reminds us of what is important. Here's Bob. Bob thinks that there are forks in the spoon tray. That's important. This verse really reminds us what's important. Only be very careful to observe the commandment of the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and to keep his commandments, and to cling to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all of your soul. 
live like God wants you to, stick to him like glue, worship him wholeheartedly. This is what is important uh, in this world. Be very careful. Warns us that there are going to be constant threats to our spirituality, to their spirituality. Keep in mind what's going on in your world. Keep alert. There are problems that are going to happen in this world. Joshua lets them depart with a blessing. And that further legitimizes their inclusion in the land of Israel, their inheritance. There's nothing in Joshua that says that they were doing something wrong by staying on the east side of the river. They are included in the land. So Joshua sent them away. Verse 7 reminds us that Manasseh acted as a bridge. It's a very strange little verse, and it is included in there. But it says that one half of the tribe was on one side of the river, and one half of the tribe was on the other side of the river. And there was a connection there. And the book of Joshua wants us to know that there's a connection between both halves uh, of this tribe. Verse 8 reminds us that God wants to bless us, and that he wants us to share our blessings. Now, the Israelites were told many times, in fact, uh, and it comes up again in, in the book of Samuel with David, that the people who were serving in the army were supposed to share all of the blessings that God had given them with the people who stayed back at the camp. This was a very important principle, and a principle that we apply to today. Because when Dakota and Lydia go and, and serve the Lord in Donna's backyard, they are sharing with us because we're praying with them for them. When our mission team goes to Mexico and serves the Lord there, we are sharing with them. They are sharing their blessings with us as we share our prayers and our gifts with them. All of our missionaries, wherever they are, this is an important principle. The people who are serving share their rewards with the people who stay back in the camp. And it started way back then. Joshua offers a final fare, well done to his departing troops and says, go in peace to their own land which they possessed themselves by the command of the Lord through Moses. Again, they are part of Israel, and it just hammers that idea home. Before long, however, their loyalty is called into question. All these little soldiers here have Star of Davids on their, on their shields, which is kind of anachronistic because David hadn't come along yet, but yeah, I hope you get the point. <laughs> they were questioned about whether or not they were really Israelites or whether they were somebody else. A report reaches Shiloh that the East Jordan tribes have built an altar. Oh, you know, you, I don't know. You, you think this is a big deal? They thought it was a huge deal. They thought they were, were giving into apostasy, giving into idolatry, and they were madder than a hornet right off out of the gate. If Canaan is the land of promise, what is the status of those people outside there? They're already worshiping another god. They were already building an a, a, a altar to and serving the Lord in ways that they shouldn't. They were just mad. And it's an imposing altar. Those East Jordan tribes wanted everybody to see this thing. I think they wanted to see it from the, from the east side because they built it on the west side, which is kind of weird. And something that they didn't notice that. You couldn't miss this. Do you, miss, do you know this guy? He's a, he's a sportscaster, but he's an alien. And it's hard to miss the fact that he's an alien. Is it, can you see he's an alien? See he's an alien? No? Kathy's looking at me, going, that doesn't guy look like an alien to me. Just because he's got this fanny thing behind his head. No, I don't understand. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Did this altar represent arrogance? Did it represent idolatry? What was the purpose of this thing? Everybody saw it. Nobody missed it. What did they do this for? And they got all mad. Before they knew any information, they get all mad about it. It was built on the Israelite side of the river, which is something they didn't pay attention to at all. Why did they build it on the Israelite side of the river? Why didn't they build it on their own side of the river? Does that mean that the east side of the river was not Israelite territory because they didn't build it on their side? They couldn't have an altar over there? What's the question going on here? Are the East Bank residents really Israelites? Did they self-identify as Israelites? or not? An important question. Sorry. My politics just entered. I don't know. Is that, is that politics? I think you can self-identify as anybody you want. From, I don't care. The whole assembly met to prepare for war. They were mad. 
Those people over there are calling themselves Israelites, and they're not. And we're going to do something about it. It's them versus us. Those altar builders are no longer part of us because they have deserted God, they have gone over to that other side, and they don't belong to us anymore. And we're going to go get them and stop them. The West Bank people sent a delegation to the East Bank, and man, it was an impressive delegation. It was led by a guy named Phineas. I hope you know who Phineas is, because he's a great man in the Bible. I'm sure all of you young folks want to name your children Phineas, right? Please. <laughs> he is a great guy. He really is. Phineas is known as a heroic defender of the faith, especially at a place called Baal Peor, um, where the Israelites committed idolatry, they committed adultery, and they started serving Baals. Phineas comes along and stops the judgment just in time. Only 24,000 people died before Phineas, through his bravery and courage and, and quick thinking, put a stop to this terrible plague that God had sent because of their, because of their sin. Their first question is really, it, it is an accusation and not really even a question. What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel? What have you done? Have we not had enough? <laughs> Implies that this sin is going to affect everybody. Have we not had enough? Haven't we done this before? Haven't we been there and done that and gotten a t-shirt? They are sinners and they knew it. And haven't we had enough of this sin? Let's stop doing this. They accused the East Bank tribes of breach of trust and breach of promise. They were no longer serving the Lord, and they had forgotten the promise that they'd made to him. They mentioned the sin of Peor, which is started by Balaam. He sent down beautiful women down among the Israelites. These women seduced the Israelite men. The men are pretty stupid. And they started serving other gods. And, and Phineas put a stop to that. And then it says, that sin was so bad they had even yet not cleansed themselves. That sin was so bad, the consequences were still going on. They were still feeling it. They were still feeling guilty over this. They still had shame from this. They were still suffering the consequences of that sin. This sin was not just a black mark. Joshua says that it's a trigger. It's a trigger to something worse that's coming. Sin today... It says in Joshua, is primed to trigger disaster tomorrow. You have sinned today, you're going to suffer tomorrow for it. The suggested solution is that they move back. You, you guys are over there, you shouldn't be over there. Move back with us, come on back with us to the, to the, to the West Bank. We all need to look alike. These are some, some, where's Beth? Anybody else watch Doctor Who? No, not, oh there, okay. Luke is my friend. Well, okay, Richard. You can be my friend, too. <laughs> these, these guys, they all become the same. They all look the same. They all act the same. They all become part of the collective. Well, God doesn't want that. He doesn't want everybody to live on the same side of the river. He wants us to be individuals. He wants us to be different. But he does want us to be united. The East Bank is unclean, they say, and not the Lord's land. Well, Joshua has just said that it is. So why are they saying that it isn't? Those people are just different. They don't worship the same way we do. They don't look the same way we do. They don't talk the same way we do. They're also aware that sin by one group or person affects everyone. Uh, this is John Luke Picard, and, and he's becoming part of the Borg. I've got a whole series of bad illustrations today from none of you guys are science fiction fans. Are, are you uh, Okay. <laughs> Your wife is looking at you. Yeah, you are, you stupid moron. <laughs> you know... When we're part of the church, we are part of the collective, okay? Ooh, that sounds horrible, doesn't it? But that's what we are. One sin affects everybody. One good thing affects everybody. We need to understand that we are in this together. And God has made us into one body. Achan did not perish alone for his iniquity, did he? No, everybody dies. We're all connected. This is a land party now. I've gone computer all on you. Anybody into land parties except Luke? <laughs> Their main aim is to establish mutual responsibility. We are all connected. And if one of us sins, we all hurt. If one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. If one of us 
is successful. We all share in that reward. And now the East Bank tribes reply. Again, this is the Jordan River. They have thought through their actions. They knew what they were doing. They've thought through their reply. They knew what the Israelites were going to say. And they had a response to these guys. God, whom they name in many ways and repeat the names, God knows their actions and knows their motives. And God is going to take care of them. They volunteer to be cursed. If anything that they've said is in any way apostasy or idolatry, let God curse us. You know, we have this right that you don't have to self-incriminate. Well, they were saying, we'll incriminate ourselves. We'll tell you exactly what we did, and if it's wrong, we'll die for it. They said, let it come. But then they reveal this very deep-seated fear. And I think it's an amazing fear. That they would be denied access to God. We're on the east bank of the river, and you west bank people are going to say, you can't worship at our place. You're different. You're weird. You speak differently. You look differently. You dress differently. You can't worship with us. They're afraid. They're afraid that future generations might say the Jordan River is the boundary of the promised land. God made it to keep you people out. You don't look like us. You don't talk like us. You're out. We don't want you as part of our church. They fear that their descendants will stop fearing the Lord. That is an amazing fear and a fear that every parent, I'm sure, has that their children will stop fearing the Lord. It scares me every day. (laughs) And they were afraid that they would stop trusting God. This new altar offers evidence that the East Bank will only worship at the West Bank Sanctuary. This is why they built it on the Israelite side of the river, because they knew that that the sanctuary was over there, and they knew that they were going to remain loyal to the God from over there. Verses 30 and 31 says that the East Bank tribes found the tables turned actually it's the west bank tribes found the tables turned on them i I knew i'd mess it up somewhere and i think i've done it about three or four times already they knew that that uh they shouldn't be mad at their east bank brothers they're the ones who've caused the breach it's the israelites on the west side of the river that have caused the problem they said those people are not like us and they made their East Bank friends uh, scared. And they were the ones that had caused the breach. Phineas replies, today we know that the Lord is in our midst. Today we have found this out. That we have made this mistake. You have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. The East Bank people, different as they were, were the ones that pointed out the prejudices that the West Bank people were, were having. And they said, we are united. We are one church. We are one country. We are one people in the kingdom of God. And the West Bank people hadn't realized what they were doing. The East Bank reply has cleared them of sin and asserts their right to be part of the people of God. The final scene goes back to Shiloh and Phineas gives a good report. It's important that Phineas is there because he is the one that really knows how to stomp on evil. You know, he's the one that really knows how to take care of people who are, who are uh, being idolaters and sinning. And Phineas says, oh no, this is a good thing. Well, if Phineas says it's a good thing, well, everybody's going to say it's a good thing. So the language, though, maintains, did, did you read these verses? It still talks about Canaan versus Gilead, children of Israel versus children of Reuben and Gad. They're still talking about their prejudices. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Does this mean that their attitudes haven't changed? Or or does it mean that that they've accepted their differences and now they're going to get along even though they are different? What what does this mean by including those words? And then they named the altar witness. A witness that we are all united serving Lord. This is an altar. I don't think it's the one that they built there. Uh, But it is an impressive altar uh, in the land of Israel. And um, it may have looked something like that. God is the God of both sides of the river. Dakota, do you notice anything wrong about this slide? Elijah? The Mexico team wanted me to preach a sermon that was just full of errors. And I put one error in here to satisfy them. 
Dakota, what's the error? Oh, come on. What? The picture? What's the picture? Elephant man. This is a Hindu god. <laughs> okay. This is wrong. <laughs> Did anybody else notice it was wrong? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I did it just for the Mexico team. They wanted me to put something wrong. They wanted me to preach a whole sermon of wrong things, but I, I just couldn't do that. <laughs> not everybody, not everybody. God is the God of both sides of the river, but he's only the God of people who trust him. Uh, he's the God of the universe, but he's, he's the personal God of those who trust him. And people who are trusting Vishnu and Ganesh and, and whatever are not part of that. Things are not always what they seem. Those people who worship differently than we do, well, we need to check to see whether or not they actually belong to the kingdom because they're not always what they seem. The Jordan River was a geographical symbol of the theological tensions that were in existence in there. And I'd like to use the Jordan River as a metaphor uh, to talk about the differences that we have in our churches and in our, in our, in, inside of our church in, with, with Christians. The first thing I think we need to say is we have to beware of the little Jordans in this world. Not the little shoes that little babies wear that have the swoosh on the side. The rivers that divide us, that make us different. And there are a lot of those. The East Bank tribes feared that the Jordan River would be used to exclude them from worship. That their differences in geography, in speech, uh, in clothing, in, in, in what tribe they belong to would be used to exclude them from serving the Lord. And now the natural boundary would become a boundary to worship. And they were afraid of that. So what are some of the Jordans in churches? Okay? Different ages. We look at old people and we go, oh, I don't know about them. They're old fuddy-duddies. They want to keep it down. And the young people go, oh, I don't know about those. Uh, the old people go, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know about those young people. They just want to change stuff. They're just causing trouble. They don't know anything. They're wet behind the ear. Age can be a, a Jordan in this, in this congregation, if we let it. Gender. I don't know about women. <laughs> I really don't know about women. <laughs> and, and you know, I don't, I'm not sure how they think. I'm not sure what they do. And I, I don't know. And we can use it as a little Jordan to divide us. Ethnicity and culture. I don't know about those Mexicans. I don't know about those Germans. I don't know about those Irish. I don't know about those French. I've got to include the French. Uh, I don't know about those people. They're different than I am. They're different than we are. They can divide our church. Denominational backgrounds. I would guess that probably, what, only 10 of us probably grew up in a Baptist church, and I'm not one of those. Uh, you know, we're Baptists, and we're Lutherans, and we're Church of Christ, and we're uh, Nazarenes, and, and we've got some Mennonites, and we've got some, uh, did I say Lutherans? Uh, you know, we've got a lot of different. Denominational backgrounds might be little Jordans that keep us apart. Style of worship. I love this cartoon. After 50 years as the church organist, Gladys made a genuine effort to adjust to the new worship format. She's got her Fender Strat guitar and she's got her Marshall stack there and she's ready to rock out, man. All right, she's ready to go. Worship styles can divide churches, can be little Jordans that go us versus them. Political affiliation. Whoa, there we go. Let's not talk about that. Newcomers versus old timers. Newcomers versus old timers. I think that, that George and Diane have been here for years because they were here before I was, a week before I was. <laughs> but I didn't know that. I, you know, they were, they've always been there when I was there, so they must be old timers. And the old timers can say, oh, those new people have those weird ideas. And the newcomers go, I, we did this and this is a great thing and we need to do that. You know, we can use that as a division in our church. Visible and invisible. Ooh. I'm visible. I'm up front. The praise team is visible. They're up front. Teachers are visible. They're up front. But what about all those people who, who are invisible, who do so much work, who help in so many ways? Is there a division between the visible and the invisible people in our churches? We may be able to cruise along, you know, and, and our differences don't make much difference until a crisis happens. And when crises happen, well, then we start boarding up the doors and we start drawing in the moats and 
drawing in the most in the drawbridges and we start, you know, drawing lines between us and them. Through lack of communication and acceptance, very subtle prejudices can develop. We're not talking to each other. If we're not accepting each other, if we're not loving each other, if we're not helping each other out and understanding each other, we can develop these prejudices that will destroy us if a crisis happens, when a crisis happens. One trick is to keep our distinctives while embracing others. I am glad that we have old people and young people. I'm glad that we have newcomers and old timers. I'm glad we have men and women. I'm glad we have, have differences of all kinds because I love differences and you all bring a great flavor to the congregation. But we need to maintain, and we need to maintain those while at the same time embracing everyone. We must keep the little Jordans flowing, but never let them reach flood stage. Back to our metaphor. You know, it's good to have differences. It's good to be West Bank, East Bank. It's good to be young and old. It's good to be, have differences. But we can't let them drown us. There's also a danger of distance. Not only the danger of, of the little Jordans overflowing us, but there's a danger of distance here. The West Bank tribes were closer to the sanctuary. Going to a church closer to home, I think, is generally preferable than to driving someplace else, generally. we got lots of reasons why we come here and lots of reasons why we don't go someplace else. But generally speaking, we need to minister where we live. We need to reach out to the, to the people that we are close to. Closeness aids in binding us to each other and to our communities. And that is a good thing. That's a good thing. But there's also emotional distance. And I think our emotional distance is growing every day. We have this modern tendency to, to rely on social media and our phones to keep people away <laughs> while we're losing friends. The number of friends that people claim that they have has gone down every year for the last 20, 30 years. We are becoming emotionally distanced from each other because of, our, I think part of it's because of our social media. We don't talk to the people next door to us. We text the person across the, across the world. We also may be emotionally distanced from God. We are mad at something God did. We don't like what God has allowed to happen. We don't, you know, and so we can be emotionally distanced from God. To bridge the distance, we have to start off by being humble. You know, the, the West Bank tribes came to the East Bank and they were just mad. They said, we're going to kill you. you don't we don't really think you have a good idea for why you did what you did. They needed a huge dose of humility. And they got it. <laughs> they got it. But they should have started off humble. They should have started off asking questions. What's going on here? You know, why did you do this? Why do you feel like you're being left out? What's going on? And we need to open up ourselves. You know, we need to understand that we have fears, that we have shame, that we have guilt, that we are different. We need to open up ourselves. But we must also hang together. On the lamp, I'm sure. <laughs> There's an African proverb that says, if you have enough friends, you can carry an elephant into the house. Yeah, you can. If you have enough friends, you could accomplish anything. We have enough people here to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish whether it's carrying an elephant into the house or carrying a sofa. We are people of shared hardship. We weep together. We bear each other's burdens. We hold each other accountable. We walk in death's valleys together. We have done this. We look forward to that day when Jesus will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, but we know that that day isn't today. Well, maybe it is. But we know that we still have a job to do. In the present situation, the suffering continues. Now, you may not feel like you're suffering, but Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's suffering, denying yourself, taking up your cross. This is not an easy job that God has asked us to do, to love other people who are different, to accept them, to care for them. Every day we share the command for self-denial and for cross-bearing. That is shared suffering. And we have to continue to do this. We live in a world of seagulls who just say, mine, 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 mine. That's all they say. That's all they say. Our culture is full of itself. We must lose it completely. Empty ourselves. Take up our cross. Denying ourselves. 
I, I'm going from the ridiculous to the sublime. For those of you who have not read the Brothers Karamazov, you really should. It'll take you forever, but it's worth it. It's about yay thick, and it's deadly dull. But Dostoevsky does some great things in there. And one of the things he talks about is this peasant woman. He has a parable of a peasant woman. That's a picture called the peasant woman with onions. This peasant woman, who is evil, she dies, and she goes to the lake of fire. And her guardian angel goes to the Lord and says, God, can't we do something for her? Can't we help her? And God thinks about it a second. Well, did she ever do anything nice to anyone? Did she ever do anything good? And the angel has to think about it for a while. And she said, well, well, okay, one day she was walking along and she saw an onion and she picked it up and she gave it to a poor person. All right, we found something good. So God says, all right, what you can do is you take an onion and you go down to the lake of fire and you, you reach over and tell the woman, if she'll just grab hold of the onion, you'll pull her out of the lake of fire. And the guardian angel says, this is a great deal. So he gets an onion, takes it down to the lake of fire. He goes up to the woman, finds the woman and says, woman, grab hold of this onion and I will pull you out of the lake of fire. And the woman says, all right, great. She grabs hold of the onion and the, and the angel starts to pull her out of the lake of fire. And as she's being pulled out of the lake of fire, other people who want to be out of the lake of fire grab hold of her and are all being pulled out of the lake of fire. But this woman says, get away from me. This onion is just for me. You can't have any part of it. And she starts screaming and kicking. And as she's screaming at them that they have no part in her salvation, she, onion breaks, she sinks back into the lake of fire. And they all perish. We must share. God is rescuing us. And we must rescue others. It's not that just God is wanting to save us. He wants us to save all kinds of people. He wants us to share. He wants us to be in this together. To be inclusive and to allow anybody who trusts in Jesus Christ to be rescued from the lake of fire. Let's pray. Father, we are very unworthy creatures, and you have extended an onion to us. And Lord, we have grab hold. At least I hope we have. And you are saving us. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to reach out to others, to not just say, this is my thing. You can't have this. But to share it with everybody, no matter how different they are, if they trust in you, if they love you, Lord, we pray that we will accept them and love them. Thanks, Father, for loving us. Lord, we pray that we would love others as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray.